Greetings and welcome to Descriptive Statistics Lesson Numbers 2.7, Measures of the Spread of Data. Here are your new terminologies for this lesson. Not very many of them, but still take your time to go through them. Before I get into the definition of standard deviation, take a look at these graphs of two data sets and just kind of contemplate on what you think standard deviation measures. Both of the sets of data have 30 data points. The beans are both 5.5. The median is both 5.5. They have different modes. One is bimodal with a 1 and a 10, and the other is bimodal with a 5 and a 6. The first data set, its standard deviation is 3.72. The second data set is 1.59. Now here's two other sets of data. Data set three has data points of 11. Data set four has 18 data points, but they have the, both the same mean, but their medians are different. Data set three has a median of three and data set four has a median of six. Data set three does have a mode, but data set four doesn't. Their standard deviations are for data set three, is 3.69 and data set 4 is 1.29. Kind of look at it and see what do you think that standard deviation is measuring. Okay, last pair to kind of look at to see if you get a sense of what standard deviation is all about. They both have 12 data points. Data set 5 has a mean of 9.75, a median of 9, and a mode of 9 with a standard deviation of 0 0.69. Data set 6 has a smaller mean of 2.17, a median of 2, a mode of 2, but it has the same standard deviation. Looking at all six data sets together, you can see that data set 1 and 3 have the largest standard deviations. 2 and 4 are pretty much middle standard deviations, and 5 and 6 have the smallest standard deviations. So what do you think it's measuring? Standard deviation measures how spread out horizontally the data is from the mean specifically. The larger the standard deviation, the more spread out it is. So let's take that data set 6 and let's add one more value and we'll add it way out at 10. Now the mean slightly changes from a 217 to a 2.75, but the standard deviation went from a 0 0.69 all the way up to a 2.28, just because that data point way out at 10 makes the data more spread out. Let's take a look at the six data sets just one more time, but this time I've added in where the mean is for each value. And you can see, according to the mean, if the data is more spread out, that standard deviation is going to be larger because it's all based on how squished together your data is around the mean. That's what standard deviation is measuring. Now, when we're analyzing data, we're going to use standard deviation heavily to analyze data. Standard deviation can be used to determine whether the data is just close or far from the mean. Let's suppose that Rosa and Ben both shop at a supermarket. Rosa waits at the checkout counter for seven minutes and Ben waits for one minute. The supermarket, A, has the mean waiting time of five minutes and the standard deviation is two minutes. So here's what this kind of puts together. Rosa waits for seven minutes. Seven is two minutes longer than the average of five. Two minutes, that's one standard deviation. So Rosa's wait of seven minutes is two minutes longer than the average of five minutes and her wait time of seven minutes is one standard deviation above the average. So seven equals our five minutes of wait time plus one standard deviation. So one times our standard deviation value. Now Ben waits for one minute. One is four minutes less than the average of five. Four minutes is equal to two standard deviations. 
Why? Because 2 times 2 is 4. Ben's wait time is 1 minute, uh, is 4 minutes less than the average of 5, and it's two standard deviations below the average of 5. So in his case, it's 1 minute equals our 5 minutes average plus our negative 2, that means below average, times our 2 minutes of our standard deviation. One of the reasons that we figure out the number of standard deviations away your value is, is because that value, and we're going to call it z, that z value is going to be a comparable value no matter what your data was based on. Here's what uh, I'm thinking. If you took a test that had 13 questions on it and you got a 10, and then you took another test that had 12, uh, 20 questions on it and you got a 17, on both tests you missed three, so you must have done the same on each test, right? Well, no, you would put that into a format that you can compare the two. Just by saying you missed three on each test doesn't mean you did the same as in uh, grade-wise on each test. What we would do is calculate it in percent. So if you got 10 questions right out of 13, that's 76.9%. Versus 17 questions out of 20 is 85.0%. It's the percentages that you can compare. That means you did much better on your 20 question test than you did on your 13 question test, even though you only missed three on both exams. This Z is gonna be very similar to changing over scores over to percents. It's going to be one of those things that we can compare to. Z will be the number of standard deviations. Our value is going to be based on number of standard deviations away from the mean. So if we have a sample, our value is going to be our X bar plus the number of standard deviations times our standard deviation. In other words, X bar plus Z times S. If we're working with population, then our value X is going to be mu plus the number of standard deviations times sigma. In other words, mu plus z sigma. Here's a fun example that we can calculate the z, compare the z's, which is the number of standard deviations away from the mean, with two different sets of data. So we have data for men, and we have data for women. And since their data is completely different, it's very similar to the test that has 13 questions and a test that has 20 questions. We can't compare just missing three. We have to change that over to percentages. Well, we're gonna figure out how many standard deviations each calculation is away from their respective mean, and then we can compare those two values. The heights of adult men in America are normally distributed with the mean of 69.4 inches and a standard deviation of 2.68 inches. The heights of adult women in America are also normally distributed, but with a mean of 64.6 inches and a standard deviation of 2.57 inches. Who is relatively taller? Let's calculate the Z for a six foot three inch tall man, six foot three inches, and we'll also calculate the Z score for a five foot 11 inch tall woman. If we were just going off of height, we would certainly say the six foot three tall man is taller, but we're looking for relatively taller, who is relative to their specific woman or man calculation. The equation we're going to use is x equals mu plus z sigma. For the calculation of the man, we're going to use our mu is our mean of our population of 69.4. Our sigma, which is our standard deviation for the min, is 2.68. 
And we know our X value. It's that six foot three inch tall man. But because our mean and standard deviation is based on inches, we have to convert the six feet three inch into all inches. Six times 12 plus three is six times 12 is 72 plus three is 75. So we're gonna use 75 as our X value. Using 75 as our X, our 69.4 as our mean and our 2.68, we're gonna throw that into our calculation. We do have to do a little bit of work here because we are trying to solve it for Z. First things first, subtract the 69.4 from both sides and then divide by the 2.68. We get a Z of 2.0896. Let's do that same calculation, but for the woman. The woman is going to use the same equation, X equals mu plus Z sigma, but this time their mean is 64.6 and their standard deviation is 2.57. Their X is five feet, 11 inches. We have to convert that over to all inches. So five feet times the 12 inches plus the extra 11 inches, that's gonna be 60 plus 11 inches is 71 inches. Now that we have our X value of 71, our mu value of 64.6, and our sigma value of 2.57, let's throw that into our equation and solve for Z. First things first, we're gonna have to subtract 64.6 from both sides, and then divide by 2.57, and we get 2.4903 for our Z. Comparing the Z values, which one is larger? the Z value for the man or the Z value for the woman? Well, 2.49 is greater than 2.089. They're relative to their respective genders. The woman is taller. The calculation for sigma, which is the population standard deviation, might look pretty scary. Let me read it out to you and then we'll work it through step by step and you'll see it's not a terrible calculation. The math behind the scenes is relatively simple. Sigma equals the square root of the sum of x minus mu all squared divided by n. Let's break it down. It looks like we need mu, we need n, and we need x, we need to do some squaring and then ultimately we'll take the square root of that value. Let's first calculate the mean. The mean is the sum of my x's over n. So we need to add up all our, our x values. 3, 4, 5, 3, 8, 1, and 2 adds up to 26. There are seven values, so 26 divided by 7 is 3.7143 we'll use. Now what we need to do is for every X value, we're going to subtract our average. So X minus mu. 3 minus our average gives us negative 0 0.1743. 4 minus our average of that 37143 gives us 0 0.8357. 5 minus our average is 1.8357 and you would continue down to, for the rest of the x values. Now what we need to do is square all of those individually. So we're going to take our x minus our mu and we're going to square that value. In other words, negative 0 0.1743 squared is positive 0 0.1304. Now I know some students make an error when they're putting this into the calculator that they put negative 0 0.1743 and they hit the square. The problem with that is when you don't put it in parentheses, the square isn't going to grab that negative. You just have to be more clever than the calculator. Either leave off the negative because you know negative times negative is a positive, 
or make sure you use parentheses around any negative value that you have when you're squaring it. The next value, 0 0.8357, when we square that, we get 0 0.6818. And we're going to continue down for the rest of our values through, through for our x minus mu. Once we have that last column, we need to add that up. So 0 0.0304 plus 0 0.6818 plus 3.3332, and so on, we get a grand total of 33.4697. That is the sum of our x minus mu squareds. We're going to take that value, divide it by our n, and take the square root of it. And ultimately, we get 2.1866. It's not a difficult calculation, it's just a tedious calculation because there's a lot of little calculations behind the scene. That's if we were going to calculate this by hand. Be aware, when you calculate things by hand, you are rounding. We did not use our average that we found of a 3.714289. We rounded it, so when we do rounding periodically, it's going to change our our end result slightly. So if you put in your homework and you keep getting the wrong answer, it's probably because somewhere in your process you rounded and the computer is expecting a different answer due to non-rounding. And I'll show you another way of doing it without rounding. The calculation for the sample standard deviation S is about 99% the same as it is for population standard deviation of sigma. There are two slight differences. One, instead of mu, because that's for population, we're going to use x bar for our sample, our average for our sample. Secondly, for our denominator, we do not use n, we use n minus 1. N minus 1 is a slight correction when working with samples. It's called the basal or basal. Uh, correction, long lengthy story there. I just, you don't want me to get into it. I understand that. But just use n minus 1 when you're calculating the standard deviation for the sample. Because 99% of it is exactly the same, I'm not going to go through all the individual steps except the last step. So the thing you would do is take your average, add up all your x's, divide by n. Same thing as we got before. Then you're going to take each of your x's and subtract your average from it. And then you're going to take that each of those values that you got and square it. You'll add up that column. Just like before, we got 33.4697. Up to this point, it's exactly the same thing. The only difference is we're going to divide by n minus 1, which is a 6, instead of 7. After dividing by 6, Take the square root of the result, and that gives us the standard deviation of 2.3618. Let's calculate the standard deviation for a population and a sample using the TI-84+. Now, first things first, I'm going to put in a, a list of data. So I do want to make sure that one of my lists are cleared out. And I just want to make sure by going to STAT, Four, and I can clear my list one as well as my list two, just in case if I have anything in there. It honestly doesn't matter. As long as I have one list cleared out, I'm good. I'm going to go back to stats, and I'm going to edit my list. Now, my cursor is on list two, so I might as well use list two. It doesn't matter which list space that you use. So I'm going to start entering my data here. 33. 42, 49, 49, 53, 55, 55, 61, 63, 67, 68. Just got to be careful how I'm putting it in there. 68, 68 again, 69, 69, 72, 73, 74, 78. 80, 
83. Now I don't even mind that I'm having to key these in because the calculator does all of the grunt work for me. So I don't mind that I'm keying these in all 32 values. It's so much easier just to key in something than it is to do this big long calculation. The calculation itself is not difficult. I find the mean and then I subtract each of these values from the mean and then square that value, then take the square root divided by n. It's not a hard equation to work with. It's just tedious, especially when you have 32 values. Now that I have my list in there, I'm going to go back to stat and I'm going to go to calc. Now I do want one variable statistics and I want to remember that my list is not in L1. I put it in L2. So my list is in L2. I don't have a frequency list and now I calculate. Now the best part about this is that this calculator not only calculated the standard deviation for the population, it also did it for a sample. So I don't have to change anything up. It's just a smart calculator. So sigma x is the standard deviation for the population, 17.6322. Sx is for the sample, the standard deviation for the sample, which equals 17.92. You just want to make sure that whatever your answer is you're putting in to whatever system or for your homework, that you make sure that you round it to the correct places of decimal. The other good thing about using this calculator versus doing it longhand on paper is probably while you're doing it longhand on paper, you're rounding periodically with your data and therefore in the long run your answer is going to be slightly off because you've done some rounding as you've gone throughout your calculation. The calculator doesn't do that. It doesn't round anywhere. Mm, well, it kind of does, but it's so far out there on the decimal places, it's really not affecting the actual answer to this. So sigma x is your standard deviation for population. Sx is your standard deviation for your sample. That's it. That's how you calculate the standard deviation on the TI-84+. Let's work through one of the homework problems from the top down. 20 randomly selected students were asked the number of movies they watched in the previous week, and the results are in the frequency table. Now to save some time, I have already put the data inside the list. The L1 is the number of movies and our L2 is the frequency. And since they're asking for what's the mean, the median, the standard deviation, and the first quartile and third quartile, well I can run stats on these values. So I'm going to hit stats, calculate, one variable, and I just want to double check that my list is L1, my frequency is L in L2, and I calculate. Cool, I can answer at least five of the seven questions for this problem. I have to do some more work for the last two, but the mean, x bar, is two. The median, scrolling down a bit, is two. The sample standard deviation, well sample standard deviation is Sx, not the sigma x. Sigma x is population standard deviation. So Sx equals 1.37649 But the directions do tell me to round all my answers for four decimal places where possible. So my answer will be 1.3765. The first quartile is Q1, and therefore that value is 1. Q3, the third quartile, its value is 3. Now it wants to know what percent of the respondents watched at least one movie in the previous week. Now I can get out of the stats area. I do know that 20 people were selected. That would be adding up our frequencies. <laughs> 4 plus 3 plus 5 plus 5 plus 3 is our 20. And we want to know 
what percent of respondents watched at least one movie? So if they watched at least one, they could have watched one, they could have watched two, they could have watched three, or they could have watched four. That means I need to add up the frequencies for the one, two, three, and four movies watched. That would be three plus five plus five plus three. In other words, a total of 16. But they don't want to know how many respondents, they want to know what percent. So I'm going to divide the 16 by the 20 and multiply it by 100 so we can see percent. So 80% watched at least one movie. The final question is 60% of all respondents watched fewer than how many movies? Well, we know that it's 60% of the 20. So I'm going to say 20 times 60 divided by 100 because I've got to get it in decimal form. That means 12 people watched fewer than so many movies. I just have to find the corresponding of movies. There's a couple ways to do this. I can add up to 12, or I could kind of subtract down from, from 20 to get to 12. Okay, the number of people that watch zero movies is four. The number of people that watched less than one would be four people. Now, if I say four plus three, that's four is zero movies, three is one movie, there are seven people that watched fewer than two movies. So strictly fewer than two would be zero movie or one movie. Now, four plus three plus five is 12. That's the number of people that watched fewer than three movies. In other words, zero movie, one movie, or two movie. That's the 12 we're looking for, and therefore fewer than three. That's when you count up. If I want to count down, I start with my total population of 20. That's the number that watched four or less. But if I subtract the three people out that watched four movies, there are 17 people that watched fewer than four movies. If I subtract out the five people that watched three movies, those are the 12 people that watched fewer than three. I was looking for 12, I hit 12, fewer than three, so my answer is three. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Good luck on your homework. You've reached the end of this lesson.